cold outside. What's up, everybody? Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. If you're watching live, Thursday, the NCAA tournament's going on currently, and the Fly Guys were losing 2-1 to one last time. Delco Steve gave me an update. But live sports going on right now. We'll update you on some of that coming up here. John Marks on a Thursday night at John Marks Media. You can see it. That's how you subscribe, comment, like, do everything else. We have our regulars lined up here on um, on our chat. So if you're watching on Instagram, you should you can watch on Instagram live, but you can also go to YouTube at John Marks Media. Subscribe, watch live, get involved in the chat. Twitter, I believe you can get involved in the chat as well. So, um, yeah, it's a good way to get involved. And we have regulars, and we're getting some new people that I see every week that I, I'm now noticing the name on names on uh, on a daily basis. So what's up to everybody out there watching? Veteran Stadium 20 years ago was imploded. And uh, I, I, Steve and I, we were talking. I, we couldn't figure out whether it feels like it's been 20 years or it doesn't feel like it's been 20 years. But it's been 20 years, which also means – that Lincoln Financial Field is over 20 years old and Citizens Bank Park is 20 years old, which is crazy to think. Remember remember the newness of the stadiums where it's like, oh, we finally have new stadiums. They're 20 years old. The vet was imploded 33 years after it was built. And it wasn't built to last. These stadiums will last longer than Lincoln Financial Field. None of those stadiums lasted. Three Rivers was a dump. All those cookie-cutter, multi-purpose stadiums, Riverfront, Three Rivers, Bush, they did a major remodel. I don't remember if that was if that was built exactly the same time, but it was the same. It was the same concept. It's like, oh, this is great. You only need one stadium, <laughs> and then we have the cutouts where you would put over the bases, or over the base, where around where the bases are, and that's where the players would get their feet jammed. The football players would get their feet jammed in it, and that happened at all all the artificial surface stadiums. I, I remember as a kid. You would watch games at Candlestick, and you would watch games probably in, in Oakland, but there were a couple of venues. Mile High was probably another one where you didn't have the AstroTurf. You had natural grass, but there were also there were also baseball, baseball stadiums as well. So they would be getting tackled on the football dirt because at the vet, you just had the turf, and then you had the cutouts around the bases that were dirt. But in a, in a, you know, in a, in a natural grass, your entire infield is dirt. So you were getting guys that were like going to the 45 yard line and getting tackled on the dirt. So it's nice enough to deal with that anymore, but now you have the, the new artificial turf, like a MetLife stadium. It sucks. But yeah, a lot of memories when I was, uh, when I was looking, looking at the video, looking back on, uh, on 20 years of veteran stadium being imploded. I, I was born in 1976. My first, uh, baseball game at veteran stadium was the year after they won the world series. So 1981, I still have ticket stubs from 1982, 1983 that I have in this sports box memorabilia that uh, I have upstairs in my bedroom. But all I knew as a kid, all you knew was Veterans Stadium and taking, and this is mostly baseball games. I didn't go to a football game at the vet until I was like a deep teenager. I want to say almost 18, maybe before I was 18, but like 17, maybe before I went to an Eagles game at the vet. But going to a baseball game was easy. We used to, I used to, on opening day when I was in high school, we, I, I would cut school or just take the train down and then jump at Fern Rock, jump on uh, the Broad Street line, take you down to the vet. But I can still smell, everybody out there that, that grew up with the vet, can you smell it right now? The stare, stale beer and peanut shells and that long walk you had to take to get up the concourse the long walk on the concrete, even to get to the 200 level, you had to take the long walk up, but God forbid you're up in the upper level. I had season tickets in the 700 level from 98 to 2002. So not a lot of years when I moved to Hawaii, I, you know, at the time you don't, you don't have the extra money to say like, Hey, yeah, keep buying my tickets for me. I just gave them the, one of our, one of the buddy's brothers who took over my seats, but no, that's that's pretty much all any of us knew was Veteran Stadium, and like a lot of a lot of great memories, a lot of not so great memories from seeing games in there. But just the smell and God, like not bad for football. 
not good for baseball. You're so far away from the action. But as a lot of people were already putting in the uh, in the chat, pe- people would pee in the sinks. Delco Steve's here. He he's going to join us. You were tr- so you were you were you weren't even a teenager yet when Veterans Stadium was imploded. So you must have went to at least a couple of games at the vet. I d- never went to an Eagles game at the vet. My parents refused to take me to an Eagles game at the vet. Uh, been to a couple baseball games. I don't remember many of them, but the only reason I remember the one was because it was the Mark McGuire home run season. I was like, I want to see that. And my dad took me in. We had terror. We were, we were in the first level, but it was like the overhang. Like we were so far back. You to right. get some of the overhang. And yeah. yeah so it's a struck, I it's remember obstructed that. view. Yeah. We had, my dad and I got a, however many game plan. I think it was, it was the year after they, it was 1994. So we had a, we had a, um, we had a, a plan and we were in, I think, 206, which I believe it was right field. And if you got high enough up in that row, you're right, the overhang. And then you're in like the 300 level. Was that? Yeah. Then you were in the, the 300. The levels, level. were, the levels were screwy there. I remember that. Yeah. I, just, uh, I was actually, Vince, I was at the same game, 38 to nothing. Yep. I was at that game. Uh, the Eagles were terrible that year. I was also at, at um, uh, well, I guess I had tickets that year. I, I remember Dion returning a punt and doing his praying, gets down on his knees and is doing his, his praying in the end zone and people were throwing stuff at him. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, what I remember, what I, what, what I remember and what a lot of people remember, I don't know, maybe the most, it's what I do is, is the, is the craziness that, that went on inside Veterans Stadium for football games, for baseball games. There wasn't enough people there outside of 93. There wasn't a whole lot of good Phillies teams. If you think about it, went to the world series in 83, I was six or seven. Right. And then they didn't make the playoffs again until 1993. And then that was, yeah, that's a decade. And that was kind of like, boom. And then that was over 94 happens. They're still pretty good. They have the strike and then they're not good again. So I, I mean, I went to I was at NLCS game five. Was it five that they clinched? I was at the clincher, and I've never been in a stadium so loud, and I've never felt a stadium move. You could feel it like concrete moving. Sixty five thousand people for a baseball game is a lot. You're used to it for a football game. They go to college games, there's a hundred thousand people, hundred five thousand people, or whatever. For a baseball game, they're usually capped out. Like what, what's the banks? The 40, 40 some at capacity. 46. Yeah, with standing room, it's like forty six. Yeah. So, like, that's really that's I, what you're I was getting. literally just about to. I was literally just about to ask you. Do you remember what the seating capacity was for the link, or not the link, the vet? I think it was sixty. I think for, I think it was sixty. It was sixty three or sixty five seating, and it depended because for for football they were able to get more seats in because they would wheel out these temporary seats, and it's actually yeah. those seat those seats were at an Army Navy game where people fell because the seats collapsed. Oh my! Could, I can only imagine. And that was right at the that was at the end of of the vet too. But I even think there was a camera on them, and they were like, "Yeah, let's go!" And then like, boom, and they they collapse. All right, let's see here. Seating capacity, Veteran Stadium, sixty five three eighty six. Pretty good. It's huge, man. And so it said fifty six for for damn really that much of a difference. So fifty six for baseball. I think they had more for baseball. I gotta see what the the attendance was for, but anyway, it's it was a huge stadium and it, it was loud too. Lincoln Financial Field has a has like the open end; it's not all closed, so it's not it's not as loud. When you look at at the the Seahawks Stadium, uh, the, the people in the national media will try to make you believe that that, that the twelfth man and it's really because Seahawks fans are so loud and great. No, it's the design of the stadium. Nothing leaves, and it's there's a lot of concrete and metal. To where everything just kind of stays in there. I'm not saying they're bad fans, but you you're gonna tell me that Seattle Seahawks fans are louder than any other fans in the yeah. in the league. Well, it's, it's designed to be like that. It's designed to be like that. And the vet wasn't designed to be like that. It just was. No sound left. And God, it was cold. And it was. And it. I. You know, I always the, the seats. I know a lot of people bought those blue seats when when the vet when they imploded when they started selling all of them. But I remember when they had different colors for every every section. So they didn't just have all the blue. They actually put those blue seats in before before the Phillies had the All Star game. I think in 1996, they had they went into the process. It took like a year. I mean, think about it. If you have 65,000 or 60,000 seats. You have to replace all of them. You know, it's, I, it takes I a actually long just, time. I actually just did a job uh, within the last few weeks where the customer had 
three of the seats in their basement. Yeah. And you, see, you see them all. I had over. to move them around back and forth every other day. It was very annoying. <laughs> yeah, they're, and they're heavy too because they have they they come in. And the, I don't want to I don't want to break them because if they need something to you, it's like uh, it's very uh, sketched out. But anyway, so all those things, but also just that, like, if and you 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 said you never went to an Eagles game at the vet. So most of the people in the seven hundred level, I'm not going to say everybody, but I'd say most of the people in the seven hundred level were hammered and drinking. So if you're drinking a lot. And especially if you've been drinking a lot in the parking lot already, you are you have to go to the bathroom all the time. You know what I mean? Like once you get in there, you're still drinking. Yeah. You're you're smuggling bottles of booze in this, there. The seal's been did. broken for hours at that point. Right. So, you, so you're screwed. So you, then now you have to go to the bathroom. Dude, when I tell you it would take a quarter and a half to go to the bathroom at Veterans Stadium, you would literally miss almost like you would miss half of the first half. Easy. Every, anybody out there that remembers it can tell you. There's a reason why they peed in the sinks at the vet. And not only was that uh, like people ask me, is that a real thing? No, not, it's not just it was a real thing. It was like they were urinals. The sinks in Veterans Stadium bathrooms were just other urinals. You know, they're some washing your hands in them. And you're talking about multiple people peeing in, in these sinks. At least to a sink. It's true. <laughs> you're lucky they made it into the bathroom at that point. Dude, if I like now, I would wear one of those adult diapers and I would just pee in the adult diaper before I would wait in line. I would get long. fucking, I would get a cat put in before I do that. <laughs> I just get a bag that. tied to my leg. And, and man, like it, it was, it was horrendous. So much to the point of, I'm, I don't want to go to these games anymore. This sucks. And you don't want to, like, and at, at that, pay, that point in that age, there's no way that I wasn't going and drinking. It was in my early 20s. So, of course, I'm yeah. going and drinking. I'm going to smuggle bottles of booze on my body because they're not doing anything about it. Um, and, it and, that, and that dude and violence and fights and rats and, like, not enough bathrooms for anybody. It was a disaster. But actually watching an Eagles game in Veteran Stadium was a good watch. It was it was a good place to watch a football game. I'll, I'm not, not a baseball game, but I always say the vet – was a good football stadium, and I always enjoyed watching games there. But you know, I don't know. Just crazy, just crazy that it's gone now. The the um, the link now being twenty one years old. How long does the link last? Like an, another twenty years? I was gonna say it's probably got another twenty. So, so in just, ten more years, they start to say the Eagles start to say, "Hey, need a new stadium, Yo City, Yo State." Need a new stadium, right? It's, it's, you got to think of what kind of technology is going to come out where they're going to have to upgrade because other st- other teams are going to start doing this crazy techno- technological stuff that they're not going to be able to compete with. So they're going to have to do something. Uh, That's people, I don't think the bill. I don't think the stadium is going to fall apart by any means. It's just that they're going to have to upgrade for those just to get players and anything like that. Right? Yeah, because they're. Their facilities are already a little bit outdated, right? Novacare, I think, I think the Novacare complex, I believe, opened before the link. It did, and it's easier to make upgrades to to that just because yeah. it's not a stadium, right? But still, it's like when you look and, and they had that they had that NFLPA survey. They do it every year now, and yeah. just the locker room at the link isn't a modern locker room. It's not. It was built twenty years ago, over twenty years ago now. So things just change. Um, then I feel like that's. Space. I feel like that's kind of easy to upgrade for in the state. Like if you're just trying to do the locker rooms, you could just be like, all right, we're building a new locker room over here right. first. And then you kind of, and then you start shifting after that. So you could, they could definitely modernize that in an off season. But I think it's also the size of it is what I, what I've read and what I've heard. It's, it's just not, it's not as big as like Something the locker is. rooms that are built now are big. There's also areas for families. Like there's just, with with the player in mind now because they want to make these players happy and we saw in, the, in that survey the players don't like when it feels like that their their kids and their wife don't they can't go chill somewhere and be comfortable and like the eagles don't get bad marks for that i just don't think they have overwhelmingly right. great facilities to where players are like damn look at this place no one's coming in lincoln financial field and going to novacare being like wow man this is unbelievable the, the, these facilities are great no because everybody has them for the most part yeah. So yeah, it's not Nashville or Jacksonville, but it bad wise, but it's also not brand new state of the art. Yep. 
I would, now, this this wasn't at the vet, I don't believe, but Bonner against Prep, a fight back in 99. Is that true? Probably. <laughs> you weren't old enough to remember it's, that one. Bonner and Prep fights have been happening for, you know, years and years and years and years and probably still happening. Uh, all right. Well, and some other people Wait, putting some. There was a few. There was a few when I was in high school. I bet. Yeah, the flare on Monday Night Football against the Niners. A guy shot a flare across the field. Ninety-seven. Yeah, I was yeah, six. No, he literally, literally shot it across the field, and I don't remember what the reaction was on TV. I just remember being like, "Really, we're shooting flares now?" It looked, looked really, really bad. Obviously. Um. It obviously wasn't that bad. No one talks about it. We only talk about throwing snowballs at Santa Claus because that's the worst thing you could ever do in the world. Yeah, the vet, the vet was much worse than any snowball at Santa or anything like that. Dude, I, I'm telling you, like for, for everybody that wants to say that it gets overblown, the fan experience, if you're an opposing fan that comes to Philadelphia, it is not overblown. You get heckled. People fuck with you. I mean, I, I, I've seen it. It's one of the reasons I don't like going to games because these, these drunks – yeah, like they really like it. It gets to where it's like, all right, man. Like, just leave them alone. There, I, I'm not saying you're not going to get heckled here, but I have been plenty of other places where I've been heckled worse than I've ever heard someone heckling other like an away team. Where, have you, where have you been heckled elsewhere? Oh, it, worst ever was Pittsburgh for the outdoor game for the Flyers and Penguins. Worst really, ever. I was, I was literally ready to punch this dude in the face. I'm like, like, I was just there having a good time. Like we expected to lose. We sucked that year. We just wanted to go have a good time. We wanted to go to the outdoor game. And this dude's just like, I didn't unprovoked just coming after me. And I'm like, dude, you guys suck for a decade to get two of the most generate two of the best generational talents ever. And yeah, of course you're going to win. Like you're they're hard. They're hardcore in Pittsburgh. They're, they're hardcore like, Penguins fan. They hate the Flyers. They hate Philadelphia. Yeah. That's why, but like I wasn't being over the top obnoxious right. or anything. We were just we're leaving. The game was over. We lost like five two or something like that. It's twenty degrees. I'm miserable. Like I was like, get me out of here. Get me to a bar. Get me drinks. And this I have this old dick just just coming after me. And I'm literally sitting there. I'm like, someone just grab my hand so I don't just snap like just smack this dude upside the head. It was some it was bad. some forty eight year old yinzer Pro- yeah, talking probably. trash to you. Who's slurring through every word because he's 10 times <laughs> younger than I am. And I'm like, dude, I'm 25 and I'm holding my alcohol better than you. And I've probably been drinking all like 10 hours longer than you. Like, come on. That's interesting. I, I, um, I, I would say. I usually have good experiences anywhere else. Met, Mets, Mets stadium. There's, there's knuckleheads. Whenever Mets fans, whenever there's a Mets game down at Citizens Bank Park, it gets ugly because the Phillies fans get ugly because the Mets fans get ugly. I really believe it's, it's how the, the opposing fan reacts is then how we end up reacting. Like for the most part, you're going to get people to throw stuff at you. If you come in the Lincoln financial field, wearing an opposing team's Jersey or a Cowboys Jersey, you can't like, you can't react and try to fight people. You can't get pissed. Yeah. Like I, I say it to, I say it to people, I said it to the, that idiot, those idiots from San Francisco that Joe DeCamera said he wouldn't advise going in the Lincoln financial field in the jerseys. And they're like, Oh, we're going and we're here's, here's the section we're sitting in. And it's like, all right. Like if you're, if you're going to come in with an anti, like an antagonistic kind of attitude, you do, you people are going to, yeah. people are going to mess with you. They're, you're going to get pissed and then they're going to piss you off and they're going to fight back. So I, I don't, I don't like it, but I've been to citizens bank park where I've seen a ton of Phillies and Mets fans fighting and they're all drunk too. And then yeah. I, I was up at uh, I was up at Shea and I was up at, at City Field where Mets fans were you know like they were being they were being out of control, and I'm just like get me the fuck out of here I don't need to I don't need to be getting into a fight with a Mets fan or anything like that it's not that serious to me Yankees fans you feel intimidated um, when you're out in the bleachers but it's like you know like they they don't mess with you for the most part they're just talking shit to you and then Chicago in the bleachers was the most fun I've ever had. So I never like, I, I, I've never I need to go back for the bleachers. I need to go back for the bleachers. Dude, it's, it's the best experience ever. The bleachers. Yeah. So we went, like, I was just there last Labor Day for the first time. Went out for, it was a, uh, I don't even remember who the Cubs were playing. Whatever. They weren't, they weren't playing the Phillies. Right. And, but yeah, so we just wanted to go to the stadium. And he's like, all right, well, if we go to the bleachers, we can't like see the stadium. So that was our right. dilemma. No, 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 I, I hear you. But you can still, you can still see the stadium. Uh, but the one time I was with this is this is two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Someone could look it up up the Pro Football Reference. But the Eagles played 
the the Chargers in San Diego. And my buddy lived he lived in San Diego then. He lives in LA now, but he lived in San Diego then. His, his apartment actually you could see uh, Petco from his balcony. You could you could watch a baseball game from his balcony. He lived in the ga- the gas yeah the, like over left field or whatever like where you see the people on there. He was. I think he was right field, but anyway, yeah, he was in the outfield. So you could see in the stadium. Yeah. And so we went to, a, we went to a game, we went to a, an Eagles chargers game and chargers won the game, but it was close in the fourth quarter. And we, there was like, I, I, I was with one buddy and then like, who, who I like, we were mutual friends. And then my buddy's friend back from Philly, I didn't really know him. I knew him, but I didn't really know him. So he was, he was kind of out of control and obnoxious. But the games of like it's the fourth quarter and San Diego gets a gets a first down that, that ices the game. And this dude right in front of us who hasn't said anything the entire game turns around, F you mother, boom, like pointing in our face and like going crazy. And he was there with his girlfriend. So I'm holding this, I'm holding this one guy back from trying to fight him. And he's yelling that he's yelling, he's like, and your fucking girlfriend's ugly. She's a like it just starts crushing his girlfriend. I'm like, oh my god, get me out of here. He went Jamal Adams on the guy. <laughs> he went Jamal <laughs> Adams on him. Yeah, but this dude was totally out of line. Like he didn't say anything the whole game, and all of a sudden he turns around and starts screaming and yelling, like spitting at us almost. So, anyway, um, yeah. So goodbye, Veteran Stadium. Twenty years, a lot of memories. You used to be able to get a um, if you would get a, a, a package of Philly Franks. What we got? Two two flyers. Let's go, baby. Nine minutes and 44 seconds to go in the game. Yep. And who got the uh, the goal? TK. Who's that? Travis Connecting. Oh, Travis Connecting. There you go. Well, TK's Tom Kelly. That's very good. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's all. I think uh, Travis gets a little bit of uh, more headline than uh, Tom Kelly. Why, why, is, uh, why is Tortorell such a dick? Dude, I – oh, my God. Don't even get me started. And he's going we, after. We don't have uh, time. We Anthony, don't have time. He's going after Anthony Sanfilippo again, who handles it like a pro. Anthony's the best. Handles it like a pro. Still asks the question. Doesn't try to fight with him or whatever. But he's still not going to be intimidated and not ask the, the question. Tortorella apparently is a really, really good guy. People don't know what we're talking about. Tortorella and Sanfilippo have been having kind of this back and forth that's going on. Mostly it's Tortorella being a dick. Um, but. He intimidates. He's a hard. He's a hard. He, he intimidates. He tries to intimidate the media. He doesn't want to be asked yep. questions. Yep. He just benched Couturier the other day, and then didn't even do the pregame news conference. He sent out the assistant coach. Like, oh, dude, is that right? Yeah. So this is this this is completely specul- speculation on my part. I have no idea. So from what I've read, that like going back to last year, Tortorella didn't want to name a captain. For this season, no matter what, that and apparently there there were quotes at one point in time saying even if Katori is back, we're not naming a captain for this season. Well, apparently upper management forced Katori captaincy on him. Since they named Katori captain, they put him on Katori has put him on the fourth line. Yesterday was the first time in ten years in his ten year career that he was a healthy scratch ever. And it's just this. I have no idea what's going on. How do you not name a captain for almost two years, and then as soon as you name on you start disrespecting the, one of the most in, in, integral players of your team. Makes no sense to me. So is this they, what, so is, is, are they going to whack him because he's not? I don't you, think so. Yeah, he's, but like, you're, David, also, you, dude, dude, you can't, him. you can't be, at, you can't be at odds with the front office if you're a coach. No, I don't think that's the thing. Like, I don't even think he's at odds with them because like they've talked about like those three, Keith Jones, Danny Breer, and Torts are in lock sync and all their decision making. I guess this is like the first thing that they're not. If, if I'm reading through the tea leaves correctly. And he's just being like, all right, this is just my version of being like, I don't agree. I I don't know. It makes no sense to me. I don't understand. There's like, I get, he might not be playing up to his capability or what Torts wants him to do. There's no way he's playing worse than 12 forwards on the team where he's not in the lineup. You, you, you can't convince me otherwise. This is, this is, uh, this is hockey. This is this is this yeah. hockey. Like this is hockey right here. This is a complete yeah. hockey conversation. And, and, I, and I pisses love me it. off with that. Tourell pisses me off with his lineups all the freaking time. Uh, like we like I could go, like I could end this show with this rant. I could. So just get me off of it. It's just bad. Well, there you go. So is the is the average flyer fan a fan of Tortorella or no? Oh, uh, I think I 
I think the average fan is a fan of him because they don't pay attention to the ins and outs and know his history of just being a straight up dick to other teams or other players. Brandon Dubinsky was a player for him when he was with the Rangers and then got traded to Columbus. He was ecstatic to get away from towards New York fired him, fired towards, and then he got hired in Columbus, then followed him. So he was talking shit on him today or yesterday because he benched Couturier. And so they've been going at it for a decade now and he still hates him and he doesn't even play anymore. So that just tells you what Torts does to people. Oh, there you go. John That's Tortorella. It. All right. So it, 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 what's, what's very interesting. So we had the temple thing a couple weeks ago and then we've heard nothing about it. The, the temple basketball, they were like their, their lines were being flagged for, for weird betting action on their games. And then after that happened, they went on a run where they almost made the NCAA tournament. So they're like, Oh, shit, on, we, better, baby. we better play well, or, or they're, they're going to think we were throwing games. So it's very, very odd how they turned their season around when, when all of a sudden the, the heat got on them, the light got on them about, about the gambling. Um, and then there was another team. I think it what was it? The Loyola in Maryland. There was a player that was yeah. betting involved, but he was no longer with the team. And I forget the exact details, but it was, so, it wasn't nothing. It was something. Yeah, and I think both our reactions were: listen, we don't know what happened, and we don't know if anybody from Temple did anything wrong or whatever. But no one should should be surprised, in particular college kids, that that if they're like if something goes on or if something to was go to go on. And you think about it from the perspective of the Loyola team: didn't they have like four, like five, six, seven wins? They were really, really bad, and Temple was also really, really bad. How easy would it be for a player? that hates the coach that knows that they're leaving after this year. Cause with the, with now not having to wait a year for transfer, anybody can leave at any point, you're on a one year contract. So you can just leave and go play somewhere else. But how easy would it be to say, Hey, you know what? I can make a couple hundred thousand dollars. We're going to lose this game. Anyway, our team sucks. I'm going to make sure we lose by 11. And like, I'm not going to throw the ball away, but I'm not going to take a shot. I'm just going to pass right. it. <laughs> throw you know, it into my hoop. <laughs> you, don't even, you don't even need to turn the ball over to affect the game. All you have to like, just like dribble, 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 throw it to somebody else. Like just totally not be, not be into the game. And yep. there was a, there was a lot of big games where the discrepancy in rebounds with Temple and the other team was like, hold on a second. Rebounding is just sometimes hustle and effort and things like that. So anyway, there was, so, there was something going on as far as the betting with that. Um, but you agree. You, you, I would even say in, in regular sports, should we be surprised if anything was to happen? If you found out a player was betting on his game or could we see the NFL players that have been suspended for doing it? But I mean, the minute that you, the minute that, that, that the outcome of a game you feel like is affected, that's where the sport is in danger. So if the NFL, it's one thing if you're betting on other sports or you're betting on other NFL teams. Not that not that that's okay. The NFL is going to suspend them for a reason. But the minute the, that you're betting on your team, even if it's the win or lose, whatever, that's where you're in danger of the government being involved. That's where people will stop watching your sport. But the Sho- Shohei Otani thing is is really really interesting. All right, so Otani's Otani's uh, longtime interpreter, like his friend from home, his interpreter. It's been over here with him his entire time. He got into a bookie for what I believe is was five and a half million dollars or or nearly uh, like he he cut so it's I think it's five million dollars is what we're talking about, Steve. I would love to know how you get into debt for five million dollars to a bookie when you don't have that kind of money. Just, and you, like at what point do you just you're like, all right, no more betting. I want my money. I don't and know what, that and who keeps taking it if you're not paying it. Like somebody who knows that Shohei Otani he works for Shohei Otani. Yeah. Four, so it's four and a half million dollars. All right, Sean. Sorry. Uh, four and a half million dollars. <laughs> Let's put it like this. It doesn't matter what the number is. He doesn't have it <laughs> like by a lot. Well, he the, the book he has it now. And you, you know what my first takeaway was? You can't bet legally in California. You, you've been able to buy and smoke weed in California for over a decade. And you can't, you can't. You I don't can't understand how it's just not bet. legalized. I don't understand how it's not legalized statewide. It's well, the California weird. government's the worst. The absolute Anyone worst that does any lie. state that doesn't allow it is the worst. Massachusetts has only been in been in the game for a year now. When They're, football season starts, they'll be in for a year. They finally got it passed. I I found myself like driving in, into Delaware and being like, oh my God, I can't do this bet. And I'm like calling my buddy, like, hey, here's my login. Can you put this bet in for me? Because I can't do anything now. 
Oh. It drives me crazy. Like, it's so stupid. I go to visit my family in Florida. Same thing. You, you can't bet. Or, and but, how is Florida not allowed? Florida well, I think anyone do anything. But I think you can. I think it's just no. certain. No, really? None? No, no sports betting. No sports betting. At least it's the last time I was down there. Which well, then the other thing, if you go to another state and then you leave, you can't cash it out well, unless you're in that state. So I've I figured that workaround out. Like so, when I go to Florida, I can look at my PA uh, FanDuel account right. as long as I don't log in. I, so like I get all the numbers live as is, but it's, I can't if I log in, I can't have someone back here log in for me. Ah. So I just so I just never log in while I'm down here. But I'll call my buddy and be like, "Yo, here's my." Username, here's my password. So you use a middleman too. You're like Pete Rose or what Shohei Otani. Some people are saying Shohei Otani was doing. <laughs> yep. So So here, here's the story. This guy's using a bookie. He's into the bookie for four and a half million dollars. Yesterday, he so he gets caught. And he gets caught because the feds are sitting on this bookie. So the feds are watching this guy. Obviously, if he's, ta- if he's taking enough action to where... The feds are watching. <laughs> yeah, like four and a half million to, to be owed four and a half million dollars. That means you're taking a ton of action. It means you're taking you're taking big bets. Yeah, big money bets. Um, so the feds obviously through the investigation, it comes up that this interpreter, boom, he's placing bets. He goes on ESPN, and I, I don't know what the hell they were thinking. I can't wait to I can't wait to hear what actually happened here. He goes on ESPN and he said that, well, I guess this was even Tuesday. I don't know. So yeah. So he said it Tuesday. I saw it on, I saw it on Wednesday that he said Otani had sat with him and the two transferred the money in $500,000 increments in several different settings. So they wired this guy, the money, they wired the bookie, the money ESPN was ready to publish a story about it. And then somebody came out and said, no, he was lying. So then he gives another interview and he said he was he he had been truthful and that he had no knowledge. Otani had no knowledge that he stole the money from him. So Tuesday night, he's he's telling a story on camera, ESPN, telling ESPN on the record, I don't know if it was on camera, on the record that he was betting it. He never said Otani was betting. He said he was betting it, and Otani agreed to bail him out and they had wired the money to this to this bookie. To get him done, and then and then the next day, like twelve hours later, he's totally changing his story. How fucked up is this? So, yeah, I mean, mm, something's up. But you can't like, if. And by the way, so now the thing is today. Now the, the representatives have said that they're they're they've uh, you know asked the authorities to investigate the theft because now they're claiming that the translator stole the money and Otani had had no knowledge of it. Is is Otani really going to railroad his childhood friend? Well, I mean, I mean, this is classic where now the the dudes like I spoke to ESPN. I was like, oh, my God, what have I done? I could get Otani suspended for multiple years. If he's if he's wiring a bookie four and a half million dollars on behalf of his friend for gambling losses. I mean, is that. That's I didn't even not, think it that. I didn't even think it that far. Well, that's where he's going to. The feds. The feds are involved. That's what I'm saying. Like if now they're asking the feds to get involved. Oh, the feds are going to get involved. He better hope he had no knowledge of this shit. Well, it's especially if it's going through California because California's already pissed about his contract anyway. They're going to be out after him no matter what. Yeah, this is this this is this is something. California is so, has him pegged for something. Anything they can get money out of him because they're pissed about all the tax evasion stuff in his contract. So now his buddy will, he's going to face jail time if he stole four and a half million (laughs) dollars from him. And like, I mean, changing the tune like he did. And now all of a sudden it's, it's been, it's, it's a theft. Like, all right. Everything has an electronic fingerprint. He like, if that really happened, then it'll, that'll be easy to prove. If it didn't really happen like that, because like, here, here's the thing. Why, why would, why would the interpreter tell ESPN? Yeah. Like he bailed me out. It like, it feels like to me, he didn't realize how much trouble this could get Otani. He felt like he was like, I got fired and like I, I, I'm a d- degenerate gambler and Otani bailed me out. He was very, he was mad at me. He wasn't pleased, but he's an old friend and he bailed me out of it. And then he realized like, oh my God, I might've just cost this guy everything. Yep. 
Wow. Something's up. Something is up. Something's up. Um, I, I wonder if they don't suspend him immediately, depending. I mean, you you would th you would think it's going to move quick because yeah, they I, they can't the NFL or as as that we haven't had a baseball issue recently, right? With gambling, like think, with the modern stuff. I think Pete Rose. No, no we, haven't, just, we haven't had a modern. Yeah. We haven't had a modern. Hey, he's it's only it's only been in the NFL, and there was one guy in the NHL. You know what? The, I wonder if I wonder if they are actively looking for these guys to be betting. Because you know they have the NFL, they hired they had that company yeah. that actively is looking for NFL players to well, be betting. They're checking I think the Wi Fi if they're at a team facility. That's a you know, that's a no no. I think I think that company also is just in general keeping an eye out for like FanDuel and the other yes. gambling because they want to make sure that there's not the insider stuff going on. So either. that's the, the company that flagged the, that flagged, I forget the name of it now, but flagged the temple action is, yeah. is a company that it, that is, that is used by sports organizations. I don't know if the NFL uses that one, but they look, they, they, they look for abnormal betting and things like that. And then they also look for, Hey, like this player, players have bet in their own names, like idiots not realizing or friends or whatever else they're figuring it out. So, and they're doing it in team facilities. If you're, I don't, I think I don't get the team facility bull crap. As long as you're not betting on your sport, I don't care. Bet on anything you want. You want to piss away your whole paycheck on any other sport, by all means, go for it. I don't get why they care about where it's done and what, like whatever besides that. Uh, Sean, make. Sean points, points out something we didn't mention. It was not on baseball. Apparently it was European soccer and some other sports. So it was not on baseball, but let, let me like, I, and I get it. I get it. If you're an athlete and you're not betting on your sport, you want to be able to bet on football or hot soccer, whatever yeah. it is. Right. Well, how about this? No, if you want to be a professional athlete and make millions of dollars, you're not allowed to bet on sports. Oh, period. Yeah, period. Yeah. That would, that would be my rule. No betting on sports, period. Because all you're all you're doing is asking for issues. But even yeah. so, it, it is a slippery slope. Oh, you guys, you get down big, you lose dude. millions, and you're like, oh, well, I could bet on my team to make that back somehow or whatever. It's the, it's, it's the Pete Rose thing. So for everybody out there, everybody out there that always says this to me, Pete Rose bet on his own team. Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. Blah 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 blah. Speaking of upsets, Kentucky just lost. Yeah, my uncle Jamie was just texting me. He said Calipari is going to Calipari is going to get whacked. And it's like he he might this time. Um, Sorry, go ahead, continue. No, but but I don't even remember what I was talking about at this point. But um, yeah, I but no, no, but with Pete, you know, Pete Rose. So he was he he used multiple middlemen. If you go, if you read the Dowd report, I'm telling you, I'm a nerd. If you Google the Dowd report, John Dowd, who investigated Pete Rose, yep. you'll think much differently of Pete Rose and that whole situation because he was using multiple middlemen. He was down big with one bookie and he was trying to make it back with another. And then he would go back to the other bookie. Now he's not betting a hundred thousand dollars a game. Remember this is back in the but 80s. He was betting on the Reds. To win, wasn't he? he was betting on the Reds to win, but here's why it matters. Right. Let's say that you're down 25 grand and you say, I'm going to bet 30 to make up that 25 and you lose. Now you're down 55 plus the vigor, whatever. So now you're saying, I got to make this back. So you're betting another 60 grand to try to get even. If yep. you bet on the Reds that night in your Pete Rose, what are you doing? Are you bringing in your best reliever on maybe for the fourth straight night because you have a one run lead? Are you playing? A, are you playing a player who probably should have the night off because of injury because you know that he gives you the best chance to win? Are you leaving a starter in longer than you should okay. and having him throw too many pitches? You're messing with the integrity of the game. You're going to manage differently because you need to win that game. And that's yeah, why but, you can't do it. But if you're, sorry, in my head is if you're the manager, aren't you doing those things because you think you need to win that game anyway? No, no. The Joe, Joe the managers don't put relievers in for three straight games because well, they, they don't, I'm saying, they're worried about think, the arm. You think Pete Rose is worried about that? No, no. But I'm saying, but like, if you think, but if you know re relievers are, I guess it's like, all right, it's different for me because I'm thinking about it now where I know a reliever isn't as good if he's pitching on four days in a row. So like I, if I'm betting on that game, I'm like, why are you putting him in the game? He's already pitched three days in a row. He's going to blow it. Like, that's what I'm thinking now. So 
I don't know. Like, I feel like it, uh, it's because you have, it's a, you have a tomato concept. can. You have a tomato can that you're going to have to go to, and there's a runner on first and second. I'm just, like, it messes with the integrity of the game. And by the way, I don't believe for a second that Pete Rose wouldn't. He's compromised. He's absolutely yeah. compromised. I don't trust him at all. He's a. I I love Pete Rose. I thought he was a great baseball player. I he he did some stuff at the Fanatic with with Mike. We did a dinner with Pete Rose. And he came in studio and he did like an hour and he's an unbelievable interview. He remembers pitches from at bats. He remembers the intricacies because he's a real idiot. He's a, he's a dummy. That's how, that's why he thinks he, he can get away with these kind of things. Cause he's so stupid. But when it comes to baseball, man, he's got as sharp as mine as any, and he loves to talk about it, but he, he is a real piece of crap. Pete Rose. The fact that he came out and finally admitted that he bet on baseball was for a book. And then he said, hey, well, all right, well, I bet on baseball. But it, was for, it was for my team anyway. After he denied it for years. I never right. bet on baseball. I never bet on baseball for years. And then he comes out for a book. The, so The only time I ever saw Pete Rose a person, I was walking through like Bet MGM in Vegas. And he was in this little like glass room signing autographs. And I was just, like, I didn't even know he was there. I just like out of the corner of my eye saw something. I'm like, what's that? I'm like, is that Pete really Rose. Pete Rose? And he was selling autographs for like 30 bucks a pop. Like a zoo animal. <laughs> Yeah, he I does like, that. I was like, that wow, a, that's kind of sad. He does that a couple does that a couple days a week. Yeah, I it's a, it was a, it was his permanent setup there. It, it was I his, it, I mean, it. so if you can make a couple if you can make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year doing that for I don't know 120 days a year, so that's yep. that's what he would do. He still he still earned a really good living. But then yep. they would have the Hall of Fame weekend, and Pete would be at a bar across the street from from <laughs> Cooperstown with a, like a meet and greet where he's getting 20 bucks a person that comes in. That's great. So I, I I love the pettiness sometimes. Yeah, and then the and the underage girls from back in the seventies where he was set to go, he was set to be on the wall of fame, and then that story broke, and he didn't deny that he was with these underage girls. In the like 70s. the Phillies Wall of Fame. Yeah, it was. I I um, just I I it was the, my first year at WIP, and I remember on a Monday, the story came out, and he didn't deny it, and people are like. Oh, well, are the Phillies going to still put him on the wall? I'm like, there's a 0% chance the Phillies are putting this guy on the wall of fame. Do you know what the story is going to turn into now? And he, they didn't put him on the wall of fame. And then was it this year? Michael Richmond, this is a great call. Was it this year where he came back? Or was it was it last year? I don't Whereas, know. And he, it, was, it had to be last year. He was completely, he was completely condescend, condescending and out Did he of come back for the, the He came back for the 83, whatever, didn't he? Let, or the 30 year or the whatever that was, the 40 year. Pete Rose, Phillies reporter. I gotta find what the <laughs> even what the sound is here. <clears throat> Flyers just lost. Did they really? Oh, and the, oh, an, an organizational loss in overtime. Yep. That's yeah, so, better than losing a brag. So somebody asked her, somebody asked him about the statutory rape stuff, and he said, No, I'm not here to talk about that. Sorry <laughs> about that. It was 55 years ago, babe. Oh, Jesus. Another reporter asked him about the story and how it affects fans and women have view him when he was made to, available to the media. He says, I'm going to tell you one more time. I'm here for the Philly fans. I'm here for my teammates, okay? I'm here for the Philly organization and who cares what happened 50 years ago. You weren't even born, so you shouldn't be talking about it because you weren't born. If you don't, you don't know a damn thing about it, don't talk about it. So there you go. Well, that sounds like typical Pete Rose for you. And this was John Dowd. Pete Rose filed a lawsuit against Dowd, who was an attorney who did the investigation. And then Dowd said, oh, oh yeah. And then Rose had to be, de- uh, he had to, he had to sit for a deposition. And I guess John Dowd had known the allegations of Rose having these underage girlfriends. So he made it known, like, you need to ask him about that. Rose, so admitted, up. Rose admitted in these depositions that, where is it right here? He admitted in the depositions that the female that she, he did not know she, until 1975 when she, she, when she was 16. So he said he didn't know, but like, whatever it is 50 years ago, but that they have to. And it was Alex coffee of the, of the inquirer. What, like what a man. It's just, I mean, it looks bad. Even though 50 years ago, like I, I don't like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if he knew she was 16 or whatever, but it's a legitimate question by a reporter. Yeah. Pete Rose is uh, it's one of a kind. 
All right, well, there you go. What do you, what do you, where do you think this, this goes next with Otani? This is a, this is a, this has, this has the, the chance to be a huge story. A he's, huge, I mean, huge story. He's the most popular player probably in sports. Face, right he's now. the face of baseball. I, he's probably like the most popular player, period, in sports right now. It's yep. like with all like his Asian connections and all that. And, you know, baseball's like worldwide sport. And they're, if he's going to be doing, like, they got to make an example. If they can't let him just skate by. And if I don't know, it's he's, he had to have some knowledge of something, obviously. And then, and then to what extent? And, and it was the, the Otani camp apparently made the, made him, made him available. And said, "Yeah, go talk." Gave him the ESPN, and then before he got fired, they were they were still talking it because remember they're, they're playing the regular season games now. The Padres yep. and the Dodgers they're in, they're they're in Korea, they're in South Korea. I didn't Otani didn't get my message to get two hits today, Dick. Yep. And then someone he got a, he got a hit on his first at bat, and then had five more at bats and didn't do anything and nothing. It, yep. And then they they kind of figure it out and they said. Oh my God! Like, what have we done? We admitted that that he we wired in money. Like, they, <laughs> we, wired, we we admitted we paid four and a half million dollars to a bookie. <laughs> did they think that people were going to be like, "Oh, what a great guy!" Bailed out his friend. Probably. Probably. <laughs> what else could they have thought? There, there's so also like, how did he wire the money from Otani's account? Right, you know what I mean. Like, it's one thing to. I don't know if you're, if you're skimming money off the top of something four and a half million dollars. I know it makes a lot yeah. of money. That's a lot of money that you're but, wiring from, from. Well, wasn't it like Adrian Peterson's like business manager stole like all his money or something like yeah, that. Yeah, David Akers got ripped off as well. But, but like, that's your business manager. They clearly have all the money, like access to your accounts and stuff like that to move money around. The translator wouldn't like, why would the translator have access to any of that? I'm, I'm waiting to see. My best friend doesn't have access to my accounts besides my FanDuel account, but that's a whole different story. Now, I mean, he could, but normally a business manager, not an interpreter. But yeah, they they, they obviously were or are very close. So like maybe he would have access to things like that. But I mean, I all I'm saying is this. It doesn't feel like that this is as big of a story as it should be right now. Is, is Major League it's, Baseball, are they chopping at the bit to investigate this? Uh, def- doubtful. I mean, they're going to have to, but I doubt they want to. I feel mm. like baseball is the most, like, p- pussy-footed of the four. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I totally agree. No, they're the, the, the poorest run, for sure. Yeah, like, they're not they're not trying to go after their player. They're like, oh, like, they, they feel, I feel like they make you, like, you make them punish you kind of thing. Like, you're so, you you screwed up so bad. It's like, all right, now we have we to. We have to, because you're, yeah. because you're really. Because you're an idiot. Right. So Adam says being married to a Japanese woman, I'm sure they did not want to shame the translator. And Adam, it's, it's, it's something that's difficult to explain, but having lived in Hawaii and I actually was living in Hawaii when the vet got imploded, but the the culture that, that you, you the the Japanese culture, which is like, Steve, I'm, I'm an extreme minority in Hawaii. It's a, you have the local culture of the Hawaiians and then it's a, it's really, it's a Japanese culture. It is. And it's hard to explain, but it's definitely when you look at it and you say, why the hell would they do that? And I, I think Adam's right. They were actually trying to not shame him. And like he come, he comes out and he says, I'm very sorry. You know, Shohei was, uh, I, I got to read exactly what he said, but he said something to the effect of like, he was very unhappy with me, but you know, he, he, uh, he agreed to help me pay off the debts. Like, why wouldn't you just say to the bookie, like, F you. I'm not going to pay it. Obviously, he's Shohei Otani, so he – that's what I'm saying. So if you're yes. the interpreter and this, like I, – I don't I don't know how this happens to where he gives an interview and says that, yeah, like he agreed to bail me out. Now they're saying, no, I, no, I stole it. How does it happen? How does this bookie allow this guy to bet that much money? Exactly. That's what I – he should have been dead by then. If it's like, come on. If someone owes you four and a half million dollars, you're not going to be like, "Yeah, let me put let it have another five hundred thousand dollar bet." You're not. If no. they've already jobbed you that many times, ah, it's like the baseball cap to the knees or baseball bat to the knees kind of thing. It just doesn't. It, this doesn't add up. No, it doesn't. 
it doesn't add up at all. This is it. It, it seems like that Otani's wh whoever whoever's advising or making decisions for Otani needs to learn what goes on in America a little bit more. It doesn't seem like they have any clue. Unbelievable. Yeah. And by the way, they can void like they can void the contract. I, I think Michael Richmond had it up there, like, oh, he just signed that contract. He's got all that guaranteed money. You, you don't have guaranteed money if this this is going on. So if he's if he's a part of the betting, Steve, but it's not him. But if Otani's a, a a part of it, the actual betting, or if Otani just agreed to wired, what do you think should happen? Let let's say that let's let's say it like that. Like he wasn't doing the betting, but he agreed, hey, we'll wire if, this. Book. All right, let's let's just say like he covered the like the guy did all the bets and Otani just covered them, right? That's right. Well, it got wired from. Well, what can't yeah. be disputed is it got wired from his account. So that that's yeah. that's a fact. It's a matter of did he have knowledge of it or not? Does he get 50 games? So you think it's a heavy suspension? I don't think 50 games is that heavy of a suspension, in all honesty. If I think if it was anybody else, they'd be done for a year. See, I think that I think that they almost have to make an example out of them. I don't, what, I don't I don't know. I like I to me this could be a full season. It really well, depends on what it is from here. I think if it was Alex Baum, it'd be a full season. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, John, like if you think that nothing will happen because it was baseball, if he was involved, I you that may be your opinion, but he's broke he's breaking federal laws by wiring this kind of money to a bookie, which is the which is the first problem. Second problem is he's the face of baseball that's wiring money four and a half million dollars to a bookie. So if he's breaking laws by doing that and it involves illegal gambling, and why would why why shouldn't I believe Otani was behind the gambling? And this was just a middleman that was making the bets. Like he's gonna ha he's gonna have to prove that, right? Like he's he's gonna have to prove at least to baseball that it was really. Hey, I said I'd cover it for him, uh, but I wasn't actually doing the betting. I didn't know what he was doing, or if he was actually. I mean, if, if there was a theft, obviously he shouldn't get in any trouble. But that seems pretty far fetched. Especially uh, when you have the contradicting stories, you know, within twenty four hours of each other. Very very strange. He mean he means boom. I I was just going, guys. My bad. So here's the deal with with Delco Steve. He's already admitted this that the Phillies are by far his fourth on the four for four. <laughs> no fourth on knowledge. I root for them harder than I. Root I for know the you root for them, but I root for the no. Flyers, and I, I don't know any of the players on the Flyers. I'm like you with the Phillies. I just I, know more about basketball than I know about baseball. And Alec, I boom, but, boom. It's a boomer. You should be able to say boom because you're from Delta. Because that's how I boom. say boom. <laughs> boom. Alec, boom. Alec, boom. My bad, guys. I got a little tongue-tied. Get excited well, sometimes. Well, there you go. I'm not a Philly guy. I'm a Delta. Like, what? He's a Delta guy. I hate the whole, oh, you're not from Philly thing. It's like when you travel somewhere, where do you say you're from? It's like I don't go, oh, I'm from Delco. I say I'm from Philly. That's or you it. say you're from outside from Philly. But yeah, when, I'm from the I, Philly area. When I, I was in like, – yeah. yeah, you don't have to get specific, re yeah. regional specific. If you're in Washington, D.C. or Baltimore or something, you might say, yeah, I'm right right outside of Philly. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Delaware County. Uh, you could say that you're from where the, the home of Tim Donaghy and other illegal, <laughs> yeah, right? illegal game fixers. Delco. Yeah, we know it's Alec. We know, we know, I know it's Alec. Delco Steve thought it was Alex Bone. Yeah, no. Nope. No, nothing about anything. You're right. So, uh, so who's uh, all right? I, I won't put you on the spot. We're running out of. Running oh, out of I here. I told you I had the the audio from back when I was an intern, right? Of the spelling bee contest. You did tell me that. <laughs> we're at the full. Well, the, well yeah, we're gonna have to run it. You're a, a total sewage. So, so play this. So this wasn't the only story, because um, because uh, Bernie, he, what's what's Bickerstaff's name? Is it Bernie Bickerstaff uh, Junior? Bickerstaff. Well, he's the head coach of the Cavs. Yeah. Yeah, J.B. Bickerstaff. So yeah. I, I remember his dad, but he's actually – Cleveland's a good team. Uh, so Dude, they've, they've been injured too, and they're still winning. It's impressive. Yeah, they're a good team. So I, I had never thought about it from this perspective in that he received threats from gamblers last season and reported it to the NBA. Now, we're going to play it, play the sound. Whatever he doesn't say, I'll, I'll fill you in on the rest. But here's J.B. Bickerstaff talking about – being an NBA head coach and the gambling stuff. Here it is. On instances with 
um, you know, some of the sports gamblers um, where, you know, they got my telephone number and were sending me, um, you know, crazy messages about, you know, where I live and my kids and all oh that God. stuff. So it is a dangerous game um, and a fine line that we're walking for sure. Uh, it brings added pressure. It brings, um, you know, a, a distraction uh, to the game that can be difficult for players, coaches, referees, you know, everybody that's involved in it. And I think that, you know, we really have to be careful, um, you know, with how close we let it get to the game uh, and the security of the people who are involved in it because, again, it does carry a weight. Um, you know, a lot of times the people who are gambling, like this money, you know, pays their light bill or pays their rent. Uh, and then the emotions that come from that. So I, I do think we're walking a very fine line, uh, and we have to be extremely careful uh, in protecting everybody who's involved. It, there's no doubt about it that it's crossed the line. Um, you know, the amount of times where... Uh, we, we don't need to hear anymore, but so... Like, it's crazy, and, and he talked to, He talked about... So, so Tyrese Halberton talked about how he felt like a prop bet sometimes because... I guess like being in a game and Bickerstaff talk, talked about this too. They're up by 11 points in the fourth quarter and he's feeling good. And some maniacs are screaming at him, like put leave the starters in because the line's 12. Right. So, so he's like, and this is on a regular basis that gambling has become so prevalent. So like he's feeling good about a win, a double digit win. And now he knows the, the point line because people are screaming, yelling about him to keep the starters in. So like it does get a little bit out of control with that kind of stuff, but call, texting them and calling them. See, my thing is for if I'm, That's I, 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 this might be a little uh, degenerate of me, but uh, if I was a co like if I'm the coach of the Flyers, or I guess the Flyers wouldn't work, but if I'm the coach of the Sixers and like I know the spread, it's like I know my fans are betting on my team though. Like I'd be like, all right, let's cover this because I want my fans to win. I want my city morale to be up. That's what I would be doing. All right. Well, sometimes all with right. the. Sometimes with the burger, like the Wendy's Frosties or whatever they would give out yeah. when you win by a certain amount of points. But like th that's a fun thing, but having to worry about the point spread because people are, not, are now getting angry about it. I'm not talking about if you had like a one-point point spread or a two-point. I'm saying if you have a 14-point spread and you're winning by 30 and then you choke and win by 13, I'd be livid if I had that bet. Like. How do you not try to cover that for your fans? You, you know, they that. well because because they can't. That's the point. <laughs> it can't, and that and that's and that's where that's where that's I said it was a degenerate take. I'm just saying. No, I, I know I it would, is. I would, I would love it if they thought that way. <laughs> but so to your point, why wouldn't they? You know what I mean? Like you had said, that's, you're going to build they're, credibility they're with your fans. fan base. They're, they're Sixers love fans. You. You got to win by thirteen instead of eleven, so you leave a player out there another possession or two because yeah, yeah you want you want to be able to cover the spread. They shouldn't even know that they shouldn't even know the spread. Yeah, but everybody knows the spread now. It's the thing. No, yeah. I know. Everybody right. knows the spread now. It's it's no, too easy no. to know now. It's just. Oh well, no. listen. By the way, the tush push isn't going anywhere. Love it. So you're I a, you're a fan of the tush push. I love it just because it pisses everybody else off. Well, that's originally why I liked it. And then I just, then when the Eagles started to suck and that's the only thing they could do on offense, it was like, really? Like, this is like your, your whole offense is the tush push. And it was their just offense. Do it, just do it three times. You get three, four yards a pop. Nick Sirianni, Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson were so bad. That was their only, that was literally their offense. Bill Walsh had the West coast offense. Uh, you know, Jerry or uh, Mouse Davis had to run and shoot. We had the tush push offense, Nick Sirianni. But did you see some of the kickoff proposed rules? Yeah, I love them. Which one? I, I just I want the kickoff to matter. So if they're lining up five yards away from each other, like down the field a little bit, I don't want the kickoff removed. Just give, give them the ball to twenty five yard line if, if you just want to. Well, if you don't want to have a kickoff, no, so the I'm, kickoff the kickoff could be an exciting play if you allow it to. I. I want the kickoff just to be normal what it is. And who cares? Just forget about the injuries part of it. That's just me. But that's a whole different story. It's never going to happen. But for a touchback to go to the 35 is, you know, a bit asinine to me. Um, yeah, well, now you can't kick it through the end zone. It's a, here's, here's what I'm saying. You're going to actually like it because there's more action. Isn't a, isn't a kickoff return? Isn't that cool? The, oh, love it. Yeah. Okay. Well, now what they're doing is they're trying to make 
making. They're trying to bring it back into the game without the high impact. Clinic. Without the high impact, right? Like they want the kickoff, they just don't want the, the injuries. So now, yeah. so what's being proposed? At least one of the proposals I saw is that where they line up on like the 30, 35, was, or the 40 yard line. It was they line up on the opposite 40. They can't move, no one can move besides the kicker and the two returners before the ball is caught, right? Or touched. And then Which they go, I, so they're at like the 35 or 40 yard line, the, like the, the, the other team. So, so they're yeah, so you're opposite you're on the opposite right. 40 so right. your kicker stands at the 35 then you're so 25 yards in front of them and then as soon as the returner catches the ball now everybody can start moving now it's like know. a real now it's like a real football play where these guys aren't going 100 miles an hour down the field Correct. and just killing them and killing Correct. themselves too by the way yeah well yeah i like the eagles fourth and 20 uh proposal of last year personally the but. onside kick yeah eh, i don't like the, well, the kick. well i want the if you're going to, or I guess if you're going to change these new kickoff rules, I think you should be able to go back to the old onside kick rules. You know what I mean? Like everybody can line up on one side. No, not even that. Like you could do the, not the one yard off separation thing. Like you get the more gotcha. five yards because that one yard separation, there's no time to get the 10 yards. For the here's ball. what I don't, here's what I don't like about the fourth and 20 is that if you if you've earned where a team needs an onside kick to get the ball back to be able to have a chance to win yeah. that means that you you've won the game and you've not dominated the game but you've you've won the game they shouldn't get some some what's easier an onside kick with the current rules or a fourth and 20 a fourth oh, and 20 ain't all that yeah. hard no, right? it's definitely, definitely easier than – the onside kick doesn't even happen that often anymore. So you've beaten this team so much so that they don't have timeouts left and they can't stop the clock. Why should they get a, why should they get a crack at beating me because they can complete a fluky 4th and 20? Fair. I hate it because you know what? When you lose a game like that where you've won the game, they have no timeouts, they can't stop the clock, oh, I'm going to go for a 4th and 20. Awesome. Get the ball back and beat you. I, I yeah. just, it's like that, that's, that's not, a fair that, point. That, that, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. The, the well, other team has won the game. Let them win the fucking game. I right? want to know. My thing for onside kicks is, are how come the kickers haven't just started just line up and be like, all right, you, I'm going to drill that guy and just crush it as hard as they can at him where he can't catch it and, and then go off. for the ri- and go for the ricochet. That's what I'd be doing on every one of those kicks. You know what? The, it's not it's, a bad idea. I've been saying that since they moved it up to the one yard line because they don't have a shot on the pop ups. They. I don't no, know. I mean, what's the what's the what's the recovery rate of an onside kick now? Four percent. It's brutal. It's so brutal. But no, I just I just go up and hit the guy in the helmet, and let's see where this ball bounces and go from there. Because though you know those kickers can aim it to anywhere. Twenty twenty three. Let me see here. I'm it's yeah. definitely under. I'll guarantee it's under five. It was one of thirty one in, in late in December. Yeah, so that'd be like th- that'd be like three yeah. percent. Yeah. So maybe they had a had another one. Yeah. So you're talking about like three, four, five percent. That's not even a. And 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 I will say this. I I I was originally against the extra point being moved back because it really. Ch- I mean, it changes the game. It goes I, from being an extra it. point. I love it's it. It's awesome. It is awesome. Love it is. It, it makes it so much more interesting. Changes the strategy, for sure. And, and you get a top like I Florida State won actually. That they didn't change it in college, but Florida State won a game on that last year against LSU when uh, they sh- or they they choked the game, and LSU came all the way back and then missed the extra point to tie the game. <laughs> mm. Well, well, there you go. That's the uh, and yes, the 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 tush push will live. So that means that Jalen Hurts is definitely worth a high fantasy football draft because he's going to have multiple t- mo- double digit rushing touchdowns again next year. Uh, Saquon, oh, will, Saquon will get the assists on a lot of those, or do they bring well, in Saquon to do to take Jalen's place? Well, and, so uh, apparently De- DeAndre Swift got tackled at the one yard line like seven times last year, which is really freaking impressive if you think about it. Or he got tackled at the one yard seven times that Jalen Hurts scored touchdowns on. So yeah. as long as Barkley doesn't get tackled on the one, you're not going to lose your touchdowns. Mm. Yeah, and the hip drop tackle is is going to be if you know what that is because a lot of people yeah. are getting injured by it. They're gonna they're fixing that, and they should. You can't. I don't see how they're going to be able to judge it though. Like the obvious, the obvious ones are easy, but you get those same, those same thing they do with the horse. Reps. The horse, same thing they do with the horse collar. A lot of times you're like, yeah, that's yeah, but like, that's, that's really not a horse collar. 
Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. But at least that has like a generic or like something that's specific. It was like, oh, right. you grabbed the nameplate. Yeah. There's no specific to that hip drop tackle. It's it's how you land more so than anything. Well, and it should be, as it's been my proposal for many years now, they should have it an official in the booth, which by the way, they yeah. really do. They they that they guy know, should be able to overrule though. He should be he able sure to sure should. Like you get the like a defensive pass and fury that's completely he sure should. And yep. he he watched the play, sees the replay right away, and goes, "Hey, by the way, pick that up. That was not a defensive. That was right. How hard is no, that? Just just go huddle. Let me take another look at it. Uh, no, like guys, this is no. He uh, that, that is right, right, right. Because you know what they do now a lot. You, I, I don't think the average NFL fan knows it. When they're huddling up, they're talking to New York. Yeah, they're, they're doing the expedited feedback. reviews. They're getting feedback and information from New York without having to officially go because there are a lot of times they're doing it where they can't review it. And they're just looking for some guidance on where to spot the ball or yeah. like, I even think they're doing it with some penalties when they're well, doing I it. Well, I just, I just want to say like, when you, especially with like the roughing the passers where it's like the light tap on the head, like how you should be able to not... review everything. You should be able to well, review everything. I, I don't even care if they review it. I just don't, I just want the guy upstairs to just be like, well, Hey, dipshit, pick up the flag. It wasn't a penalty. Well, I like, guess that's why that when I say review it, a live review, that's not a review where they, they throw the yeah. flag and they run over. Yeah. If it's if it's if it's a if it's obvious, I'm not telling you they need to they need to be cross checking every holding penalty that's out yes. there. But the agree it's got to be misses. blatantly yes. obvious. Yes, blatantly obvious. Like I, what I go back to is the Saints Rams that defensive pass interference where the dude on the Rams decapitated the guy on the Saints yep. on the yeah. and oh no no big deal. We're just gonna pick that up. Well, let the Rams go to the well, Super Bowl. And what like, and cool. you know what they did that that put the whole then that made interference yeah, the, reviewable, the which reviewable. was a total disaster because it's an but overreaction. They, they, didn't want, they didn't want it to work, though. They made they, sure it didn't work. They didn't do they, it the right way. It's, no. easy, it's, it's not difficult to do it. It's not difficult to put a senior official up in the booth. That senior official can talk it over with the NFL as well. They can be on the same line and discuss it. All you really need, need to do is say, hang on a second, just slow it down, slow it down, like, like huddle up as officials. Let me get another look at this. All right. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good call. Go ahead. Right, like yep. you're doing it in real time. If we watch at home and we can see a suspect call in real yep. time, they by the way, they can too. So and the, re- rewind it real fast, take a look at it, boom. There's some of them are just so like I just want the ones that I'm going, oh my god, that's so bad. Like that be fixed. That's the only ones I care about. I'm not gonna sit here and complain about the holdings on every put like every play, this, that, and the other thing. But if you see a defensive pass interference that is egregiously missed or egregiously called, that wasn't a Exactly right. They, just fix it. Just fix it. Just and, and this goes into the sports gambling thing. You're as like an NFL. Another reason why t- they should have it. You're right. You're, you're taking so much money from these companies to sponsor and all this other thing. You need to get it right. You need to get it right. It's just that, plain and simple. You need to get. Uh, you have to have the accuracy right. It's actually it's actually a great point in that if you're compromising a game because of a bad call that could be easily fixed by just looking at replay. I mean, think about it. The technology that we have, and you're not allowing your referees to use that in real time. Like, what are you doing? And I, think no I, I know, I know, like one for everyone is the the play clock. I like I, the play clock one doesn't bother me. I understand how it works. I understand that they look, they see zero, they look down, the ball snap, they don't care, whatever, fine. But like, how hard is it to just put a buzzer on their hip and just be like, all right, when you feel that buzz, that's at zero, and you throw the flag at the right? No, no, why not? Like. Like it's so stupid. It's it's so simple, stupid, easy. Just do it. Just I don't know. Yeah. You're you're a multi billion dollar organization. You can't fix stupid. It's just it's pathetic. All right. Well, listen. Uh, Steve is uh, going to be up the Poconos tomorrow night. I I may decide that I'm doing a show tomorrow. I'm not sure. I got something going on that'll make make me kind of late to doing it. So there may not be a show tomorrow night. But Steve's uh, Steve's going to be up in the Poconos for a bachelor party. But then he's going to be home. Because I'll be big home Saturday morning. <laughs> Are you coming home Saturday morning? Um, as soon as I wake up Saturday morning, I gotta get back to help. All right. Well, the, the Nicole Gallo Sunshine and Bubbles Scholarship event. It's a 5K run and walk, and it's in honor of Steve's sister Nicole. Um, ninth ninth year. This is the ninth annual. And I, I was also uh, told today to tell you we got to update our numbers. We're over seventy students helped so far. Thank you. Is that your dad getting involved? Yep. Yep. Mr. Gallo, thank you for that. Let me change and, all my uh, notes here. And over 180,000 raised, I believe the number he said. Really? Yeah. 
180,000 raised. Yep. Wow. Yep. That, that's unbelievable. So yeah, well, he said we're about 20, like, average about 20,000 a year. So can't complain with that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get it over 20 this year. The Twitter's Gallo, G A L L O 3310. If you're not on Twitter, just like Google Twitter and then Gallo 3310. It'll take you to his page. <laughs> and you'll see nothing. <laughs> well, you'll see, a, you'll see a link that will take you right there. So if you can come out on Sunday, it's, uh, stuff starts about 11, I think. Steve, I'm not. Uh, that's, yeah. Right if now. you get there around, uh, the signups or the registration starts around 11. So like usually around noon is when it starts uh, getting right. So there's a kids fun run. There's a 5K that takes you through Drexel Hill. There'll be music and food and everything else. So come out on Sunday. If you can't come out, uh, you can always donate. So again, just go to Steve's uh, Twitter page and you just click on that link. Boom, it'll take you to the page. And uh, there's an easy way to donate right there. But otherwise, hope to see some people out there yeah. on Sunday. It's we got a fun. positive. We got a positive weather turn today. We're at 51 and sunny. It's all take that. that all, take that every day. We're getting the rain out of the out of the forecast. My my wife asked me 100 percent on Saturday. Have it, <laughs> dude. Yep, I will be. I'll be inside all day Saturday, and then um, I'm I'm training to run the the kids fun run because I cannot do 5K. I will not do 5K. <laughs> so there you go. All right. And by the way, we talked about who it helps. So and now it's over 70. So the the costs are helping with scholarships, and specifically, this is at. This is at Bonner and Prendy. Bonner and Prendy, and then we have some for our Holy Cross too. Okay, all right. Because one thing for tuition and scholarships, but as as we know, many of people in our community sometimes come come you know have hardships. So it's also for some uh, some relief, some financial relief for fit for families to help offset some of the things that they need. So seventy students in the Cole's memory have been helped, and there's going to be many more after this season. So again, that's on Sunday. So Steve, don't don't. Don't don't do like the hangover where they no. can't find you on Saturday morning. <laughs> Where's Steve locked in the basement? Yeah, no, I'm, it'll be a chill. We're just gonna be watching college basketball and drinking some beers. I right, can you can you post to your Instagram stories so people that want to follow yeah. what you're doing tomorrow night? S Gallo yeah. thirty three. Yeah, we could get some of that going. All right, why? Well, I'm looking. Hopefully, for, I, I hopefully, I re hopefully, I remember to do it. All right. Well, if you don't, that's so well. I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you on Sunday. Uh, I'll we see might, Sunday. I might see everybody tomorrow night. We'll see. But other than that, subscribe, like, comment. Uh, what else are we supposed to do? Follow. Right, Steve. Follow. Yeah, all those good stuff. At John Marks Media. You always get three out of four, and it's never the same three. <laughs> my, my brain's mush. Follow Steve S. Gallo 33 on Instagram and Gallo 3310 on Twitter. That's how you can get uh, get the info for the run on Sunday. Everybody, we'll talk to you soon. Oh, poor Flyers lost tonight. Yeah. Hey, poor they got Flyers. a point. They got, they got a point. An overtime loss.